Our first session is a keynote titled Imperatives to Reimagine the Postcolonial, and it's a pleasure to welcome to the stage Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, university professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. After Gayatri's keynote, there will be a brief audience Q&A. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. It's a great pleasure to be here. I want to start by thanking my very dear friend and co-worker, Surya. Surya, a man, right? Not Suraya, a woman. Surya Parikh, who is going to do the PowerPoint on Zoom. And of course, I thank Hur al Kasimi from the bottom of my heart. I feel very identified with the project here so that I really do feel as if I'm continuing with something rather than merely a guest. Also, the idea of the afterlives of the postcolonial is very interesting to me. I'm, I'm really sorry that I could not, uh, could not attend uh, the events yesterday, 4th of March, uh, the ex exhibiting the postcolonial archives because I am not an artist. I was amused that on the visa, I was uh, marked as an artist because this is an art foundation thing. I'm not an artist. I am a paid humanities teacher. It's a very different thing from being an artist. Art surprises me. This is, I can't predict art. Art surprises me and I need that surprise. And therefore, I really feel that what I have to say today may have been, I wouldn't have changed my position, I'm, you know, after all, I've been working at this for a rather long time, but it may have been uh, affected in ways that I can't even imagine what they would have been. So I, my apologies to the artists um, uh, who showed yesterday and who gave the tours, because I believe it would have been useful for me to have actually participated. Because the goal, they sh said, of their workshop was to explore the content of the post-colonial archives segment of the exhibitions, and I really would have seen w what the post-colonial archives were. So let me just say, before I go any further, because I don't want to be too long about this, that they all know that Samir Amin, uh, the, uh, the Senegalese French uh, activist who was even older than I am, I'm 80 this year, <laughs> he, uh, who taught us a lot of things, almost in one of his last uh, statements, he said that um, we have to change our mindset from the fight against colonialism that was started with non-alignment in Bandung in 1955, and we, we must recenter ourselves to confront globalized neoliberalism. It's a real change, which is what turns nation states into global capital managers. Nation states into global capital managers while encouraging the nationization of identity, thrust us back into the post-colonial, nationization of identity in the name of anti-colonialism. As you all know, especially, um, especially Naim Mohammed, whom I know well indeed, he's from uh, my university and I first met him in Bangladesh, as you well know, Bandung is being used now quite regularly to claim first rights in Afro-Asian collaboration. We came first, we did this, etc. It's become, I don't know if there are many South Asians here, it becomes something like Naxalbari. Everybody claims to have been a Naxal. I mean, if there had been so many Naxals, India would not be what it is today. But, but at any rate, I just wanted to get this said because what I say will, of course, be critical. It will be more focused on the afterlives. 
But I do feel that it would have been perhaps a little bit different if I had been surprised by the art yesterday. As global neoliberalism becomes the main instrument of exploitation, ideological oppression, and subalternization, we have to reimagine what the colonies were. See, I have a question mark next to my title. Imperatives to reimagine the post-colonial? We are gonna do it together. Reimagine what the colonies were and our complicity with the colonies. Complicity means, in Latin, being folded together, folded together. I don't mean conspiracy. Our complicity with the colonies. We must look at class space. I mean, after all, here we are at the trucial states, right? What were those truces? We must look at class-based collaboration. For example, the truces at the inception of the Emirates. What was there before the colonies? Did all deployment of power relations start with the colonies? I speak from a country with thousands of years of caste oppression. The colonies are day before yesterday. Uh, is our task still only to undo the effects of colonization? Are we nothing but post-colonial? As planetary destruction by human greed is upon us, the mindset change that is required must accommodate such questions and more. At my keynote for the Asia Society of New York City, where Huor al Qasimi was a panelist, I situated our emphasis on colonialism in this way. We have to change our mindset from the fight against colonialism that was started with non-alignment in Bandung. I was quoting Samir Amin. And recenter ourselves to confirm globalized neoliberalism which turns nation states into global capital managers while encouraging the nationization of identity in the name of anti-colonialism. Thus, colonialism can provide a cultural excuse for finger pointing. Everything is someone else's fault, which some of us describe as the Mugabe position, referring to the technique of the late dictator of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, who could excuse every oppressive move in the name of anti-colonialism. It's happening in my country now. The destruction of Latvian says Delhi, for example. You folk are artists. It, was, it also allows artists, cultural workers, and educators to be distracted from the task of combating and restraining neoliberalism by acknowledging complicity by way of our funding, for example, with the very structures we want to question. We are complicit with them. As for decolonizing by using native language, it is only the elite sector that also knows the imperial language, English, French, etc., that, that can get away with this one. Those at the bottom, and I think many of you know that for 35 years and more, I have been working with the landless, illiterate, so-called untouchables on the border of uh, running four elementary schools, living with them, training them, uh, for, on the border of Jharkhand and West Bengal. And so when I speak about the people at the bottom, I know them as well as I know my students at Columbia, and I have the same standards there. This is something, by the way, I'm not university professor of English and comparative literature. University professors are not in a department. I'm just a university professor. Good enough for me. At any rate, the, um, it is only the, uh, the elite who can get away with those translations. Those at the bottom who only know the local version of the native language do not even know what decolonization might mean, since nothing changes for them. Indeed, they will not understand colonialism except as some dates and names given in textbooks when and if they go to school but they will understand class caste because that still works. They themselves are riddled with caste prejudice. Don't think at the bottom it's all pure. 
the intention and the intuition acquired by the traveling researchers of a loose group called Radiating Globality is that in globalization and in spurious symmetry, the spurious symmetry level playing field promised by, the, by globalization, the structure of corruption that existed in the pre-colonial longue durée have become operative in so-called post-colonial politics. The return of theocracy, for example, in India, the Silk Road in China, imperialist interpolations in Europe, etc. And that's what we should look at in terms of what we are criticizing and our own complicity in this. In acknowledgement of complicity, there is no weakness. It makes for a much stronger practice. When we are concerned, what we are concerned about here in Sharjah, of course, is bigger than fighting neoliberal global exploitation, but rather the terrifying disaster that is overtaking our world. Here is an image. Now, can I see the images? If I can't see them, it's hard. Let me see. You see what that is? Uh, from my Asia Society keynote. I commented on the disingenuousness. This is the Metropolitan Museum, right? Land acknowledgement, everyone applauding. I commented on the disingenuousness of acknowledging the Native American and consoling them with the age-old gesture, giving the name art to what used to be only folklore. This is a, an age-old gesture. In the meantime, forgetting genocide, I suggested, I mean, after all, you can't just put this up and say, hey, you know, we're all for you. There's history there. I um, suggested that the task at the top, as at the world's universities and the rich 1%, was allowing the, quote, Native American the same modernity as ourselves in today's contested future, rather than propose sustainable tourism. I quote the World Monument Heritage Fund. We should all learn to undo our minds, to realize that the world itself, ourselves as the world, and this is everyone, the world itself can only acknowledge that it was imposed on commons. This is an unbelievably difficult mindset change, and this is why a humanities teacher talks about it, because the business of the humanities is soul-making, mindset changing, not, not one person, but collectively, all over the world, like they have institutions like Oxfam and so on, they should begin to think about teacher training institutions of that sort if they are going to, because it's possible. If they can have an Oxfam, they can have this as well. That's a solution. The, in order for people to change, this mindset is almost impossible to achieve because it's against the human. The human starts it. So therefore, we were imposed on commons. Since I work both with the elite, like ourselves here, and the subaltern, hanging out with the poorest of the poor, where I be, will be on the 12th, I can claim that at the bottom the task is to impart to the subaltern indigenous a real sense of the cartographic world. We, those of us who are far away from them, they, we actually take the bourgeois apologists for them and romanticize them and do not grant them the humanity that they share. The subaltern is also in modernity. And that's a very difficult thing to understand. So therefore, the idea of the cartographic world, this is something, I mean, my teachers, for example, a few years ago, since I know how they are taught geography in their schools, they, I asked them, is the earth bigger or the sun bigger? But for one, they all said the earth was bigger. I realized that the cartographic imagination, they have imagination, but very ill-educated. Therefore, one of my friends um, from uh, Ilorin, uh, Kwasu, uh, Kwara State University, 10 years old, 11 years old, rural university, 
doesn't, and he's smart, but very ill-educated, class apartheid in education. He doesn't know what the Mediterranean is, okay? Not even uh, doesn't know where it is, what, as to whether it's a mountain or a what. So therefore, the, it, to impart to the subaltern indi indigenous a real sense of the cartographic world, rather than dwell on the fact that most indigenous languages have a word for world, but not for colonialism or deconstruction. I want to share with you now an inadequate description of how I undertook this recently. You must realize that this is part of a very long drawn out process that started long ago. Here is the session on the 26th that I had with these folks. I mean, I talk to them all the time. We started with loving the cartographic world. Turned out they were all sitting on the ground, okay? I was in New York. I was talking to them on the cell phone because obviously there's no Zoom or internet or anything available there. Two outside a village, one in another village sitting on the ground, and the student in yet another, because that's the normal way that the Indian subaltern sits on the ground. I was, of course, in New York on the phone. I began to talk about the fact that they were sitting on this great globe, and I said, it is so big because they know we have, we've been talking about the globe a lot, but I'd never tried this one. I said, look, th think your backside is on that globe. You just imagine it's so big that you can't tell it's round, but it's hanging in outer space, remember? It's hanging, it's hanging, and you're sitting on it. Try to think, try to think. Okay, so this, this went on. Uh, if the sun was shining, no, uh, the great globe hanging in space, turning so slowly that they, they didn't feel it, because in their sc uh, school books it, says it turns like a top. So they think it just turns like this. They have no sense that they are there. So turning so slowly that they, were, that they didn't feel it, but they could measure it with a stick if the sun was shining. This I've been doing in classes for a very long time, how far uh, the, that the world is a clock. If the sun were shining and that they were the center and the poles and the tropics could be measured from each of them and went on and on. So that they, where they were sitting was the center of the globe. It's a huge round thing, and it's hanging in outer space. They have to think it. They have to think it. Imagine. Okay, so therefore, because they, their imaginations are not killed. Their intelligence has been destroyed through historical crimes, and it's hard to teach intellectual labor, but the imagination remains. But at any rate, the, but I was able to speak to them in their own local language, even using the colloquial word for backside. Much will have to be done to consolidate this imagining, to map it for today's world work, and then, then to imagine the time before the map imposed on commons. Commons is maybe not hard for them to think. I cannot just claim it, because they also surprise me, but with no signage, even for villages, these are people who do not travel. My best female teacher, who's fantastic in algebra, has never been on a train. She has, this is India. She has never been on a train, okay? They don't travel. So the, the, and this will have to happen, top and bottom, local by local, for global, through the heart's language. An immense collective job. This, rather than post-colonial, that is what, I mean, we are distracted from this task of really rather quickly, the world is in disaster. There is no future for our children and our children's children and their children and their children's children. And to an extent, unless there is a mindset change, no amount of planning and policy will turn because people will find loopholes. At any rate, so let me go through a series of images used and to be used at the bottom. The first image is because I happened to see a BBC witness that I thought would be useful. And so I immediately had my colleague Moinak Bishash, chair of the Department of Film Studies at Jadopur University, 
have Bengali subtitles made in a weekend. It is absurd that the guy who had access to the technology so that he could make the subtitles for me in a weekend so that I could speak this, it, this is urgent, so that I could speak to the villagers and also they could find how the hell they found this where there's hardly any internet at all. But we did this. But it is surprising that the guy who had the access to the technology, himself a Bengali, did not have access to the local Bengali speakers in the villages where I have my schools. Luckily, my institutionally uneducated supervisors, one of them only seven years of school, the other a high school graduate, institutionally uneducated supervisors were able to correct the Bengali as we went along. Because of course, we've been working together 17, 20 years, so they've actually been trained I, I should say with pride by me. So as uh, have they, how they manage to watch it where there is hardly any internet is another story. Here is a comparison between London and Bangladesh in terms of the ocean overwhelming the shores. You see the Bengali subtitles. Thames Barrier in London, a giant defence against the sea. It was built long before anyone worried about global warming, but things are very different now. The job of the barrier is to keep London safe from flooding, and right now it's coming up to high tide, and the great steel gates are holding back a phenomenal volume of seawater that would otherwise enter the city and potentially cause disaster, which is why climate change matters so much here. They're constantly watching the projections for how much the sea is going to rise. It's also why we'll probably need a bigger barrier by 2070. And this was what first hit me about climate change. While some countries can afford gleaming steel structures like this, most others can't. On the coast of Bangladesh, back in 2009, we saw seawater pouring into this village. The flood was so deep a boat was the only way for us to get around. And the only defence was a wall of mud that was broken. People were struggling to repair it. A human chain passing handfuls of mud to fill the gaps to try to hold back the sea. The big worry here, of course, is if the forecast of climate scientists are right and the sea rises even more, maybe by a metre, by the end of the century, well, how on earth are these millions of people going to cope? While London is secure, the only refuge here was a narrow ridge. The people who've done least to cause climate change were suffering most from it. Life was far more precarious than I'd ever expected, and it was getting worse. Yet, we cannot just dismiss mud as bad. A phenomenological approach, absolutely necessary below and above, teaches us to notice its form of appearance, as in the Congo. My school folks must understand, and this is the conversation on the 12th, my school folks must understand the Congo as part of the earth on which they're sitting. And here is the living mud that let us breathe. Pete, Pete, that uh, all of the, uh, what I'll show them, it's actually laid out how Pete lets us breathe, and it's also laid out that it's possible without being institutionally educated to understand how Pete lets us breathe. So this is the next thing. I will share with them the way in which 
the locals are fighting the loggers because the loggers, of course, have been in their shawl forests in our neck of the woods. See, this is the shawl forest in uh, near my villages. You see how completely bare it is. It used to be thick when 35 years ago I entered this space. Even then, it used to be thick. But the, so they understand what logging does. Um, every time I see a post-it, I feel like I'm drinking blood because I know how much goes into the making of a post-it. I mean, it's not possible for me to use a post-it. The ideas, uh, the video says, how will the Congo villagers understand this when they have no education at all? But they are understanding, and that will help these villagers in India. Collective work. Among elite activists of planetarity, there is a great deal of unexamined celebration of indigenous systems. In truth, they were mostly fearful of nature because of inadequate technology. It was a good fear. It was, it was the kind of fear, for example, in early Judaism that you have. Early, older religions, in fact, do have this kind of fear, which is a, a way of approaching the transcendental. So that's what they had, which we uh, tend to think of as not cultural conformity, but environmentalism. The, um, what the elite activists need is the long-term live-with experience that I recommend to anyone who mistakes cultural conformity for ecological revolution. As David Hardiman of the old Subaltern Studies Group said recently, I learned, I quote David, I learned personally from my observation of politics in India in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, we overestimated the radical potential of the subaltern, being braided so closely within elite culture and religious systems, they were always open to being co-opted by reactionary interests. The lesson is that it generally takes many decades of ideological and cultural struggle to build radical movements, end of quote. Here's a picture of plastic that I thought would speak to the ex-subalterns I work with. Wherever I go... In Indonesia, we filmed these soldiers trying to clear a river jammed with plastic. That seems pretty futile. Wherever I go, I ask to see the worst quarters. Otherwise, I don't see this plastic-filled horror. I still remember Karachi, where I was put up in a five-star hotel by Habib University. And the poorest part, which even the dean, who used to be a student of ours at Columbia, which even the dean had never seen, was where the Rohingyas were defecating in standing water. My supervisors in the villages practice English. Here is a sentence from one of them, Ujjal Lohar, who has had seven years of school many years ago during a time when India had the ill judgment of not teaching English at all, <laughs> decolonization. But he was able to write this sentence. This is Ujjal. Dear Didi, sorry Didi, the environment in village is very bad. Now there is plastic everywhere. Now the government schools is sitting under the tree, which we have done before, good. Our schools were, were closed for three days for Sharshuti Puja, the goddess of learning, the school, school closed for three days. School closed for three days for Sharshuti Puja because Mike song, too loud, you, you know, for the puja there. I can see the Indians nodding their heads. This is the joke of active theocracy among the ill-educated. But Ujjal could write, the, the environment is bad, now there is plastic everywhere. I cannot take pride in the fact that some of them have been made obsessed against chemical fertilizers and pesticides because I don't impose anything. They must want things. My task as a paid humanities teacher, they don't pay me, right? They, they're free, but I am paying ancestral debts there. So I'm a caste Hindu, I screwed them. So <laughs> therefore, the, uh, the idea there, so um, 
uh, they, they themselves, some of them have become obsessed against chemical fertilizers and pesticides, but at least I show these little fields given to them by their landlords, their sharecroppers, for whom they are sharecroppers. Okay, this is owned by a woman. This is a, this is a mustard field. And these two, the first rice paddy, the, the, the first is rice paddy in the um, under one acre land owned by Shonut Lohar, whom you see here and you see me, and the second indeed on common ground. This one and this huge ban, unbelievable well they built with their own hands with the help of an equally obsessed person in the state government and this area really is used by everyone and this is a fantastic potato field. But I must pass on from these because in the face of the planetary disaster, these belong to an earlier mode of being. And I will now pass on to my second point and make an end. Today I have to add a subtitle to my original title, which was Imperatives to Reimagine the Postcolonial. We must add that every declared rupture, declared rupture, afterlives of the postcolonial, as I have declared a rupture from the postcolonial is also an unacknowledged repetition. Every declared rupture is also an unacknowledged repetition. The world is rocked by the repetition of post-colonial forces right now. The leader of the Russian Federation is talking about the Bolshevik Revolution as a colonization of the old United Russia and the establishment of self-determining nations that could withdraw at will as economic and political manipulation by the leaders of the Bolsheviks. Ukraine is speaking of national sovereignty. This is all post-colonial talk. Uh, is speaking of national sovereignty. My own country, India, in a simulation of non-alignment, is not supporting the Security Council resolution to condemn Russia for the same reason that it, for the, for the stated reason that it buys nearly 50% of its arms from Russia, a deal against which many of us in the post-colonial nation have protested over the last few years, a typical post-colonial situation. So we cannot reimagine the post-colonial fully quite yet. The situation in Ukraine, as I have said before, gives me personal pain because the parents of my only wonderful white relatives in the world my first husband's parents, my first husband Talbot Spivak's parents, came from the area around Kiev, where Talbot Spivak's grandfather bought the name Spivak for the family to avoid pogroms against Jews. The family was attached to the old country, so it gives me personal pain. Yet, we must also notice that post-colonially, what we are internationally praising there is a typical ancient masculine topos. Although there are some women in there, it's a typical ancient masculine topos. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. That big lie. Remember the World War, uh, the First World War poem. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is sweet and proper to die for the fatherland. A desire, very old masculine uh, topos, a desire so that we can send our children to be dead, a desire to fight for the country while taking care of the women and children. We are praising a Eurocentric discourse of democracy in Europe, and we are supporting an accusation of war crimes in the International Criminal Court. Compare this to the immense difficulty we have had. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a. Uh, citizen uh, ambassador of the Free Rohingya Coalition, and we have had great difficulty. Compare the immense difficulty we have had the, in placing Aung San Suu Kyi on the International Criminal Court with the Gambia as a brave but non-European accuser, and it is still hanging fire. We rightly praise the Ukrainians, not fearing death, yet I was obliged to give one interview on the fact that young folks in Myanmar and Thailand had lost their fear of death because there was no international recognition and they were pushed into violence. That situation has not changed. Let us look at the coming back of longue durée racism within our post-colonial enthusiasms. 
then. In Ukraine, Indian students are being identified with their state, and one has allegedly been killed as a result of India's stand. A black African woman was saying on BBC TV this morning that in Ukraine, they're choosing Arabs and Indians before they're choosing black Africans for leaving the country. As a person who has been, rightly or wrongly, described by others as one of the founders of postcolonialism, I would say that the real imperative today as we move toward acknowledging planetary disaster and saving a future for our children and their children, one imperative is to conduct the postcolonial with general social justice. Let us also remember that ungrievable women, taking the wonderful word from Judith Butler, ungrievable women, like the ones who, among the Ajmer Bagarias, are obliged to bleed freely when they menstruate, because small capitalism around the trepanning of salt in the area is the only relentless criminal. And the women say they must focus bleeding on just one part of their ghagras so that they can use as little water to clean the stain as possible because the competitor for the dwindling water supply is cooking the little food that they can forage for their families. Imagine that. Imagine that kind of situation with water. Can we make the subaltern become aware enough of the cartographic world, enough for them to place Namibia with the Bagarias without prompting from us? Whatever we do, we are going to have to adapt to a hotter planet. In Namibia, amid a dusty landscape baked by drought, there's a vivid patch of green where a class is being taught how to cope without rain. We know now, uh, maybe in the next uh, two to three years to come, we don't know even in that way to get even a single um, drop of rain. And therefore we need now to come and come up with something which is going to help okay, their children. This too is part of the post-colonial continuing decade after decade without any serious notice at all. And of course, Rohingya women remain just as ungrievable, raped as part of a general genocide. And I end with some subaltern speech from them that we cannot hear in postcoloniality. <laughs> Hare <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sorry I couldn't be more charming and cheerful, but thank you for listening. Thank you so much. We'll take some uh, questions from the audience now. If everybody, whoever has a question, could raise their hand, we'll pass on the mic to you. I can answer from here, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, can I have a piece of paper, please? Yes, sir. Thank you so much for that, um, guys. Riji, this is Anjali Arundekar. It's a pleasure oh, to see you, sorry. and belated happy birthday. Um, my question is a vulgar one in many ways. Um, from what I heard. Uh, in your sort of 
imperative or call for new theorizations of oppression where the referent is no longer the colonial. Is there a way for us to hold on to the term post-colonial by, and I'm going to use a neoliberal term, by diversifying what it refers to? I mean, you started off, you know, by also speaking of caste oppression, but instead of creating a kind of competitive set of reference, could we have a non-competitive set of reference to which the post-colonial may be attached? Because it's still a term of possibility, despite the kinds of limitations you've talked about. Um, yes, and could you show me where you are? I'm right here. Okay. Good to see you. Can you hear me if I don't uh, use the mic? I forgot. Can I take three? Yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Um, my name is Suraj Ingde. Um, I really celebrate your uh, critical appreciation of this concept. And I love the note you ended with, uh, which was self-confessional admittance about the, the academic Carnival around post-colonial. Here, um, here. <laughs> I should stand. Um, Love your hair. Thank you. That's uh, that's because uh, that's the Dalit swag I carry, and 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 so my question also comes from my experience as a Dalit scholar in this field. Uh, oftentimes, the obfuscation of the experience of the marginalized, especially the body politic of marginalized, was rendered into a class dimensions or the European fascination around the idea of subaltern. Now, one can appreciate the decades after the so-called post-colonial era, um, where the elites of the colonies and the subalterns of the metropoles joined together to engage with this debate. How do we think about the post-hyphen of post-colonialism? What would it render? I think. And I've already, I think there is a concept called global castes that one can really dig into the archives where people from Africa, Asia, the elites, nevertheless, massage their shoulders in conferences such as this, but the oppressed caste in each society, the Dalits of Africa, the Dalits of South Asia and, and erstwhile, I think need a new paradigm within this convening. I thank you for your contribution. Wonderful questions. Um, Thank you for this. Uh, my question is first, when you were rethinking, I mean, please stand up so I can see who it is. That is Naminata Diabate, oh, one hi. of your gra intellectual granddaughters, because my dissertation director was your mentee in graduate school. So my question has to do with when you guys were thinking about the post-colonial as a concept, to what extent did you foresee the possible misuses or the limitations that it could have encountered you know, through time? Did you possibly see that coming? And the first, second one is about the post-colonial. Post to what extent, what can you tell us about that? Because it's gaining momentum right now. And of course, the colonial, we're not gonna go there, but that's another fight. Thank you. Quickly, uh, now decolonial, decolonization, in fact, is, um, you know, yes, Mugi wrote a book called Decolonizing uh, the Mind, but that was really a good long while ago, and he was really addressing, apart from everything else, closed down the, uh, the English department, etc. Mugi is a very, very dear friend of mine whom I met in 1966, long before the book was written, the, uh, he was really asking the Gikuyus to be able to imagine that the langu their language was not just private, that their language was also a public language, and so doing the theater and so on and so forth, but acknowledging that in government practices, global practices, one must acknowledge the, um, the, the languages, the imperial languages, including Swahili, to be... Uh, uh, to, uh, to be used instrumentally, etc. And I think that's a very different, and even uh, Gugi has 
in fact, modified that position in many different ways. As I say, I know him very, very well indeed. We are friends. So the, it seems to me that decolonizing, one should really think about what that means. Who can decolonize, especially decolonizing by using native language? See, I have, I mean, I certainly think he's a, an absolutely brilliant man, but I have profound differences with Professor Mignolo, who's going to close the conference. So I would say that it's when we decide we can decolonize, uh, group by group, I think we should ask, what, is, what would global decolonization look like? That would, that would be knowing the restraining laws of global capital, which is very, very different from generally the nation-based decolonization projects generally undertaken by people who are quite comfortable within a, 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 the enabling violation of colonialism. That is to say, children of rape who will not recognize that that's how it was, but that's what we are. I'm not, as I'm, I myself, that's, I mean, I'm speaking to you in English, I teach at Columbia University, how much has colonialism done for me? Colonialism did a fantastic thing for me. The, the, uh, the, 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 the tribals and the real Dalits, whom we treated like animals, they Christianized them and they became my teachers. My parents were smart enough to send me to such a school, not a convent school taught by whites, so that therefore I was taught by Christianized subalterns. And that's how I know. They taught like their lives depended on it. Colonialism did that. So we behave like animals. So therefore, you have to be able to recognize that it's a mixed bag. Colonialism is a horrifying thing. It's a very bad thing, full of oppression. I, I should know, I was born in British India. But nonetheless, we have to realize that we can't just decide to decolonize nation by nation, elite by elite. Look again at what it is that you're doing. The, um, I was very much helped in South Africa by this when I went to speak in Cape Town and they had asked Ashin Membe and Judith Butler not to talk. And so I just went and said what I thought that this idea of roads must fall was a very confined idea at the uh, Black Oxbridge. They listened to me because I had, the, and they, they said through Harry Garuba, they said that Gatis Spivak really spoke to us. Why? Because they could hear that I was sincere, that I was not really just flattering them. But at any rate, so that's one of the things I would say about decolonization. But did I foresee? Of course I foresaw. The best book that I ever wrote is called A Critique of Postcolonial Reason. It's a long book. I hope it is reprinted. It is absolutely my best book in my estimation. Published in 1999, in other words, written long before. Of course I foresaw, it's all in there. Nobody takes a look at the fact that it was a critique of postcolonial reason. Because I am what I am, everybody has decided I must be Poco. As for sa saving, see, postcolonial means something very different in those located spaces from what it means in the diaspora or the kind of classed elite uh, from the universities that can join together in great consortiums. But the thing is that I do not think there should be competition and turf battles. You want the term, keep the term. I'm not here to trade in terms. I am here to try to make people see that fights over terms is a very parochial academic kind of thing, fights over terms. Keep it, keep it clean. That's all I say. That's your responsibility. I'm not here to buy and sell terms, okay? Approve of some, okay, Spivak said you can use, not like that. So therefore, I have nothing really to say about, about, and about uh, competitiveness. No, I don't think one should compete on this. There are other things to compete about. So therefore, that's fine for me to keep the term, no, prob no problem. And it's not, the re it wasn't a referent anyway, colonial. You know, what is one concerned with is the question. And I'm concerned with this disaster because it's bigger than everything. 
It's bigger than capitalism. It's bigger than colonialism. It's bigger, it began in Mesopotamia maybe when the first seed was thrown. This is why I'm interested in it. You can't take away my interest. That's all I'm saying. In 1997, when I wrote about planetarity, I was thinking about this very vaguely, but slowly it came to me, and so therefore I'm asking you to think about it. If you would rather keep post-colonial, keep it. And so therefore I tried to say something about just keeping post-colonial because it can distract in certain ways from this. So I've given you, with as much integrity as I can, my own point of view. Incidentally, the very last, someone complimented me on letting the subaltern speak, the Rohingya women who are never heard. That's Nasiruddin, by the way, who did that. The, the thing is that I'm not speaking against the state of Myanmar, okay? I am not interested in opposing anyone. I'm interested in building from that unheard speech. Now, I will say to my friend uh, Suraj that, you know, the, the whole, I, 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 I said this to Yashadatta Alone, and he was very taken by it. Reclaim the subaltern. The subaltern uh, Gramsci died in jail, trying to think about the Dalit. In, it's just another, Dalit after all is a Sanskrit word. And in fact, there are many people in India, especially Northern India, Northeast India. How do I know? Because I know. Who do, now are embracing the word Dalit through government intervention, etc., but do not use it for them. The people, uh, for, uh, I use the word that they use for themselves, which is SCST, Scheduled Caste, Scheduled Tribes. So, you know, they don't, they didn't know quite what that stood for, but they knew what that stood for, okay? If you understand that statement. So I told, told Yashadatta, Yashadatta, reclaim the subaltern, go back to Gramsci and see what he was interested in. These were Dalits who had to walk on, like walk like a horse so that the elite could sit on their backs and rest themselves, the Savoyar. These, uh, these are Dalits, these are subaltern, is not a European word. It's, they didn't think Sardinia was Europe. So that to an extent, the idea, uh, Gramsci's work remains to be done because he died in jail when he was 40, 30, in 19, he was 37 years old, wasn't he? Uh, no, he died, uh, well, I'm thinking, but not, it's, I'm not thinking clearly because I'm now 80 years old. But Gramsci, was, Gramsci died miserably in jail. And the Mussolini's uh, uh, the prosecutor apparently had said, this mind will not be allowed to think for the next 20 years. Gramsci defeated him, thought, filled those little notebooks with his little handwriting so that we are still thinking, reclaim him, reclaim him. The Dalits should reclaim him rather than create this competitiveness of where should they go post-post-colonial. I'm not interested in a post-post-colonial. That seems to me to be so academic. We are colonial, pre-colonial, post-colonial, post-post-colonial. That's not where we are at. And also within the Dalit situation, I want to hear the folks, and I can't hear them because these women from Kerala, uh, two women from a, a very, very subaltern university sent me the entire, their entire text on menstruation movement. I didn't even know there was such a thing. They wanted me to write a foreword. Why? Because somehow they had heard that I was in my can the subaltern speak? There was a woman who actually used menstruation as a means of communicating resistance to patriarchy. They, nobody notices this, 40 years, no one notices this in writing. The thousands of pages written on that piece. They, but they knew, and that I had, I had uh, written about Draupadi, who, was, uh, who had come into the court, had been brought into the court in her white uh, thing, menstruating. So therefore, they had written to me and asked me to write a foreword on this kind of stuff. So that this kind of work, work that's being done down below, rather than by folks as they are coming up. I love the fact that it is now possible for me to have many colleagues who are in fact supposedly by birth Dalit. But I'm not a determinist. I don't think 
that I believe education is possible. I believe ideological change is possible. Otherwise, I would kill myself. I was born a Brahmin. I would kill myself if it were not, if my parents, who were completely so, they had so annihilated caste that we didn't even know caste, I began to discover caste as I began work. I would kill myself if the education were not possible so that I am not caste determined. That's being a casteist. So therefore, the same applies to my Dalit brothers and sisters who have become my colleagues. And so I will say that the, what we should really look at uh, is not how to do the post, 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 post colonial, but rather reclaim subalternism when it began. For Gramsci, it was a word that really meant subordinate. It was a word that really meant those who only took orders. Nothing more, nothing less. So that would be my statement. I believe I've spoken to all three. I believe it's also time for uh, me to shut up so that you can go forward to other wonderful talks. Thank you again.